One of the first lessons we learn in private pilot ground school is that an aircraft that is at a constant speed and at a level altitude is in equilibrium with respect to the four forces of flight. That is, lift equals weight and thrust equals drag. These forces can be expressed in pounds. So for example, our aircraft could weigh 2,000 pounds. And if we're in level flight, we also have 2,000 pounds of lift. But what are the factors that are generating those 2,000 pounds of lift? And how can we as pilots control one or more of those factors? You may have seen the lift equation before, where we take lift, L, on one side, and then have an algebraic expression that looks like this on the other. It's a bit intimidating to stare this thing in the face, but we could break it down and look at how it's showing us the factors which affect the amount of lift we generate. Lift is a product of taking the air we're moving through and deflecting it downward. If we deflect more air downward, we're creating more lift. If we remember this simple principle and keep in mind that everything in this lift equation is expressing how much or how little air the aircraft is pushing downward, it'll start to make more sense. There are four terms in this equation which relate to the four factors influencing lift. We'll color those in to distinguish each one. The first term is C sub L. This is the coefficient of lift. Engineers use this term to talk about how effective the wing is at pushing air down and generating lift. Things like wing shape and its camber affect how good the wing is at generating lift, but the wing's angle of attack plays a role in this too. The second term looks a bit like a P, but it's actually the Greek letter rho, stands for air density, which is affected by changes in pressure, temperature, altitude, and humidity. The third term V is velocity, the true airspeed the aircraft is traveling. The final term is the wing surface area. Each of these four terms expresses how much air the wing is able to push down to generate lift. The coefficient of lift is affected by wing shape and angle of attack. A wing at a low angle of attack is not deflecting a great deal of air downwards, but as that angle of attack is increased, a greater section of that air above the wing is able to be turned downwards, increasing lift. The air density, or rho, is a measure of how many air molecules there are in a given space. In environments with lower air density, there are fewer molecules to be pushed down by the wing to generate lift, while at higher densities, the wing is able to push more air molecules down. A higher air density leads to an increase in lift. Velocity, the true airspeed we're moving, affects lift. Simply put, if we're moving relatively slowly, we're not deflecting as much air down as we are when we move faster. Finally, the surface area of the wing dictates how much lift we produce. The surface area of the wing of the Cessna 172 is smaller than that of the Cessna Caravan, and so the aircraft with the greater wing surface area is able to affect a larger swath of air, increasing lift. Why we care about the lift equation and learn about it so early on in our private training is that even though there are many factors here that we can't control, there are some that we can. Air density and surface area aren't typically things we can control for in flight. We can't magically change the weather while in flight to make the air more or less dense at a given altitude, and we can't typically grow or shrink our wing while in flight. Now, some aircraft have special flaps which both increase the camber and surface area of the wing, but these won't be found on a lot of trainer aircraft. So air density and wing surface area may not be in our control, but the coefficient of lift and velocity are in our control. The coefficient of lift we can affect by changing our angle of attack, typically done by pitching up or down, and the velocity is obviously controlled by what true airspeed we fly. Let's see how we can play around with these two factors in flight to influence lift. We're in equilibrium. If our aircraft weighs 2,000 pounds, we have right now 2,000 pounds of lift. At this airspeed, a relatively low angle of attack, one degree, will give us the coefficient of lift necessary to maintain that 2,000 pounds of lift. Let's reduce the power and begin to slow down. If we want to maintain altitude and keep the 2,000 pounds of lift while slowing down, our coefficient of lift must increase by increasing angle of attack. We'll be slowly pitching up. As the aircraft's speed reduces, the angle of attack and coefficient of lift need to increase. At no point have we changed the amount of lift we're generating, which is why our altitude remains constant at 1,100 feet. You may recognize this as the slow flight maneuver from your private pilot training. As our speed decreases and angle of attack creeps higher, coefficient of lift gets larger and V gets smaller. 
Before long, we've reached a new equilibrium, once again in straight and level, unaccelerated flight, but rather than maintaining 105 knots as before, we have around 60 knots only. This large reduction in V has caused us to need a higher angle of attack, read right here around 5 degrees in order to maintain 2,000 pounds of lift. Let's increase power and the aircraft will begin to accelerate. Now V will be increasing, so we'll need to pitch down slightly to decrease angle of attack and coefficient of lift in order to maintain altitude. Once we've accelerated, we return to the old equilibrium of 100-105 knots and a low angle of attack. And again, at no point have we upset the balance between the 2,000 pounds of lift and weight. This inverse relationship between velocity and coefficient of lift will become important as we start to look at climb performance and the effect on load factor, that is, different weight forces that occur in flight. You can really kickstart your training by looking into private and instrument ground school and the other courses available at flight-insight.com. Dash on over there today.